Welcome back to Vermont Edition. I'm Jane Lindholm. Beekeepers in parts of the eastern United States are reporting massive losses this winter. The Plattsburgh Press Republican quotes New York's Champlain Valley Beekeepers Association President Dick Crawford as saying that his members has, have lost up to 90 or even 100 percent of their hives. I'm Charles Mraz, and I'm a third-generation beekeeper here in Middlebury. My grandfather started the company in 1931, and my father took it on from him, and then myself now. So we're 81 years in business. We do treat our bees with chemicals, but they're organic chemicals, um, and mainly for mite control. Um, we use formic acid. Ants produce it. Bees produce formic acid, actually, in small quantities. Um, we do use a, a low-level antibiotic called teramycin to control American fowl brood. Um, but if used properly, which we do always, it isn't during the honey flow. So the antibiotic doesn't have a chance to get into the honey. And that antibiotic has a very short half-life, so you're not, it's not something that stays in the beehive and you have a problem with it later. Yeah, I'm, I'm Kirk Webster. I have... Um the Champlain Valley Bees in Queens, and the, the bees are all here in, uh, in Addison County, and they stay here all year. And I have about um, 250 colonies I produce honey with, and then I also raise queen bees and nucleus colonies. The people that I found as mentors were very successful organic farmers, and so, you know, that influenced me a lot right from the beginning. Yeah, so I don't believe any of this nonsense about how chemicals are absolutely essential, you know, to feed the world or anything like that. Because I've, you know, I've seen you know, living evidence to the contrary that they're just delaying the uh, the time when you know the, the the stuff will hit the fan. And I think we're going to have to learn how to to raise the bees without treatments in order to to uh, for the genetic stock to maintain and, and, and improve its hardiness and resilience. I think that in the long run, these, the real, the, the most successful examples are going to be in this path of, you know, moving towards using biology to solve our problems rather than fighting against it. You know, and using, learning how to tap into nature's own, you know, creativity and productivity. I'm Andrew Moncris, and I run Lemon Fair Honey Works in Cornwall, Vermont. We do not use any chemicals in the beehives. Uh, we chose not to treat for two reasons. Uh, one is that it seems clear that a lot of the chemicals that are being used by beekeepers are building up in the wax, which is causing the wax to become contaminated. Uh, when the wax in the comb is contaminated, that's where the bees raise their larvae, and it causes health problems. The second reason we don't treat is that uh, ultimately it, it doesn't necessarily work. The generations in the mites are even shorter than the generations of the bees, so that the resistance to the chemical treatments develops very quickly among the mites and the chemicals stop working. And so you find that uh, the chemicals that used to work extremely well to kill mites in the bees no longer work. By treating the bees, uh, you're keeping bees that aren't resistant to the mites or any diseases. You're keeping them alive with the use of a crutch. At this point, we may see a lot more losses this year as we get further into this no treatment paradigm. Um, but at this point, we're not losing any more than some of the guys that are treating. I think CCD did come to Vermont, and it's been here. And I get tired of these reports that we didn't have CCD. Um, in the winter of 2004-2005, we lost 45 percent of our bees, um, and what we saw in the hive was what I would describe as a northern version of CCD. And what we found is we found 
a large cluster of dead bees in a hive that was even like moldy. You could tell it's been dead longer. And then you'd find a smaller cluster. And then you'd find an even smaller cluster. So as if they're retreating from them? As if they're trying to get away from themselves. But of course it's middle of winter and they can't fly out of the hive. The people who are supposed to study these things are arguing over what CCD really is. And um, they've never come to a really satisfactory conclusion. I, I do suspect that they're right when they, they usually will all posit that um, you know, it's a, a combination of stresses on the bees that, that brings it on. I haven't, I haven't seen that exact syndrome in my bees, you know, where the adult bees all suddenly leave and they leave a kind of a normal brood nest behind. Uh, there's people with a lot more letters after their names than I have that have opinions about CCD. And people, have, they've, they've looked at funguses, they've identified a couple new viruses, they've done some studies at Harvard, that show that some of the new neonicotinoid pesticides that are being used, the new seed treatments that are dusted on the seeds before agricultural crops are planted, are all really harmful to the bees. So when people ask me that question, I always tell them the answer is E, which is all of the above. I find it hard to judge beekeepers one way or the other. Every situation is different, every management situation is different. Um, things that work for some beekeepers don't necessarily work for others. Uh, formic acid works well for us, but I don't know if it would work well for a migratory beekeeper. Maybe he doesn't have the opportunity to put it on and treat because of his pollination schedule. So you have to take all those things into consideration. I'm not in the first point in saying somebody's wrong. I'll tell you, a, a good beekeeper is somebody who can keep his bees alive. Dead bees don't breed resistance, okay? If a bee dies, they're not going to go on to breed resistance to disease. That's why I choose to use these organic controls, because I don't get rid of all the mites. I don't get rid of the disease, but the bees survive that and they can survive it over generations of bees, and, I, and that's how you can build resistance over time. It's harder for the larger operations to not treat because uh, the results of making a miscalculation are much worse because your numbers of colonies are higher. And uh, our method is more labor intensive, and so if you have 10 times as many colonies as we do, uh, you can't necessarily afford to put in ten times the amount of labor. When the varroa mite first came, it, it was just so um, out of balance with our bees. I mean, at the beginning, it was literally true that you would lose a hundred percent of your bees if you didn't if you didn't control the mites somehow. But that's not true anymore. Now the you know the bees have adapted, and the, you know I I can't prove it, but I believe that the bees and the mites are both adapting to each other. You know, it's not, uh, it's not very smart for a parasite to destroy all of its hosts. You know, it needs to have enough left to, you know, to, to uh, uh, colonize again in the future. There is a guy in France who has essentially developed for that country a Varroa-proof bee. And he challenges people to come, and every year he has the great Varroa challenge, where beekeepers come and try and find Varroa mites in his hives. And it's incredibly hard to find any mites because his bees are now so resistant. Well, I think we're all in hopes that our, our bees are healthy and happy this summer. Coming down on the sovereign light cafe. I'm begging you for some sign, but you still got nothing to say. Don't turn your back on me, don't walk away. I'm a better man now than I was. That day Let's go down to the rides on East Parade By the lights of the Palace Arcade and